Hey everybody, it's Goblin X, and welcome back to some more Magic Arena. And today we're going to be playing another Arena Cube Draft, or the December 2022 Cube. Without further ado, let's get into this pack. Some incredibly powerful options in a ton of different strategies. Great Henge is ridiculous for the green ramp decks. Any green deck that plays a lot of creatures can reduce this card's cost by a decent amount, and it will take over the game, giving you additional mana, some life gain, and most importantly, making your creatures a little bit bigger and drawing you extra cards to keep you fueled. So Great Henge is incredible. Chandra is also incredible, one of the best Planeswalkers on Arena, a very flexible card. Fits well into a mono red aggro deck with the plus one ability to draw extra cards and the minus three to remove creatures. Fits well into ramp decks with the plus one ability to add a couple mana and the minus ability to get rid of creatures. And fits well into control decks with the ability to remove creatures. So Chandra works really well in pretty much any red deck in the format. And I'm a super big fan of her, so I think I'm going to take Chandra here. There's also Scarab God, which is a ridiculously powerful finisher. A 5-mana five 5-5 five, five that comes back to your hand anytime it dies. And can exile creatures from graveyards to make 4-4 four, four copies of them. Just an exceptional pack, as you're always going to have in the Arena Cube. Alright, pack 1, pick 2. Now, we don't have an exceptional follow-up to Chandra. Not a super big fan of Dragon Master Outcast. You kind of have to treat this card as basically a six drop since it doesn't do anything until you control six or more lands. It will absolutely take over the game from that point on, but it is a very, very flimsy body. And when you consider it as being a six mana card that can die to anything that can kill a one one, not the greatest. There are plenty of really powerful six, seven mana and more plays for the same reason. I'm not that interested in Platinum Angel or Ulamog. They're a little replaceable as just super big late game plays. Really want to get the good early game plays out of the way off the bat. And I don't consider the Dragon Master Outcast to be one of those. Do like Gilded Goose quite a bit. Great little mana dork for any green based strategy. So we could roll with that here. Maybe move towards a green red ramp deck. Both of our cards being able to produce some extra mana. Seems like a solid place to start. Awaken the Woods is kind of interesting for a dedicated green ramp deck as well, but I think I'd rather just grab the uh, one drop that's nice and efficient. Love me a goose. All right, pack one, pick three. First two picks haven't worked out incredibly well for us because we're just not seeing a lot of red or green in this pack. The only card in those colors being a Magda Brazen Outlaw, which is fine, a two mana two one that makes a treasure every time she becomes tapped can ramp us up that's a fine pickup it's also the sanguine brushstroke which is like a bigger blood artist the blood artist that comes with a blood token that's fine take one of these triomes if we want to speculate towards a very multicolored deck here but none of these contain both red and green yeah it's just a pretty awkward pack for us after these first two picks not really in love with any of these cards search for Escont is fine in control my favorite card might just be Brushstroke, like Brushstroke, Magda, the Triomes. Not a ton of good stuff going on here. Very unsure what we do out of this pack. I guess I'll just take a Brushstroke here, just in case we're getting like hard cut off red or green from this direction. And we start pushing into a black strategy. All right, pack one, pick four is a lot more reasonable. We do have a Flames of the Firebrand, which is a relatively cheap removal spell. Three mana for three damage divided as you choose wherever you need it. Pretty nice. There are a lot of very powerful aggressive strategies in the format. This can go ahead and ship away at a lot of their different dorks. Very good against uh, green decks as well. Kill their land or elves and their Gilded Goose and all of that. Flames of the Firebrand seems pretty solid for me. Moving to like a red-green mid-rangey sort of deck. Ovenwald Hydra, again, nice big late game bomb. Scholar, nice big late game bomb, but get all the good sheep cards. All the interaction off the bat first. Incubation Druid, that's beautiful. If we want to push heavier into red, we can go for a Grim Lava Mancer or a Rekindling Phoenix as well. Rekindling Phoenix, a nice mid range threat. Grim Lava Mancer, a card only really good in like a dedicated mono red deck. Because this is very good at giving you multiple burn spells once you're out of gas. It starts throwing your graveyard at your opponent's face or at their creatures. Pretty good in that deck. I think I want to just take Incubation Druid here. Get kind of committed towards Green Red Ramp. That feels pretty exciting. 
Although the only card we have that's pushing us into green right now is Gilded Goose. We're not that deep into green. We are very deep into red. But I don't really want to double up on four drops this early. I'm going to take an Incubation Druid. Ember Cleave, pack one, pick six here. Pretty good sign. Card is ridiculous in any red deck. If it's a dedicated mono red deck, you're living the absolute dream. But even in a green red, more rampier, slightly slower strategy, this card just ends games. Plus one, plus one, double strike and trample. Absolutely massive effect on an equipment, especially when you can cast at instant speed. Another very good cheap piece of interaction, Lightning Strike here. Two mana, three damage to any target. We'll absolutely take it. That also sticks to Mono Red here, which is one of the strongest archetypes in the format. So we're going to try to prioritize red cards a little higher than green cards or red-green cards so that we do have that potential opportunity to move into the Mono Red deck. So I'm going to take Lightning Strike here. Because, again, that's going to fit into our red-green deck super well, and it's also going to fit into a mono-red deck. For the same reason, we'll take a Glorybringer here over a Crag Crown Pathway or a Gigantha. Those, again, both solid options for the red-green strategy, but push into that red. Very powerful, aggressive color, and it's a card we'll still use in green-red. Field of the Dead might be the strongest card in the pack. I am a very big fan of the five-color Field of the Dead decks, but that's not... Where we're headed here, getting an Ember Cleave pack one pick six. We'll take Visionaries, a great two drop for aggressive strategies, three power for only two mana, and this potentially draws you a card if it's tap ability. Definitely like it more than the Smoldering Egg. Smoldering Egg's more of a good card for like a blue red spells deck that's more controlling. When you're an aggressive deck, you want your creatures to be attacking immediately instead of having to put work into flipping the egg. Um, this pack is unplayable for us. Uh, we'll just take a Platinum Angel, I suppose. It's the only card that technically is castable. Um, unplayable again. We'll take Phyrexian Revoker. We could actually play this, and this gives us a 2 mana 2 1, which is not very good. But every now and then our opponent has a Planeswalker on board, and we get to shut off that card's abilities. The 2 mana 2 1 destroy target Planeswalker is uh, significantly, significantly better than just a 2 mana 2 1, and that is a possibility for that card. Just cut red out of the pack, try to keep people out of the color. Take a duel here. And grab some random garbage as we move on to pack two. Fires of Invention. Not random garbage, nor is Crawling Barons. I don't think we're actually going to be a super good Fires of Invention deck. I think I'd rather take Crawling Barons. There are some decks where Fires of Invention is sweet, so kind of crazy to pass that and let it go pick 15. But um, I don't think it's really good in like a mono red or very aggressive strategy. Fires of Invention is very good in a mid-range deck with a lot of different colors because what that card allows you to do is cast your spells for free as long as you have enough lands to play them but you can only play two spells per turn. So it's really good when you can play like Fires of Invention on turn four, then play a four drop for free. And then on turn five, you play another land and play two five mana spells for free. That's what you kind of want to do with Fires of Invention. You want to make these explosive plays where you're essentially playing like 10 mana worth of cards on turn five. Not something that like mono red or red green really aggro decks can do a lot. So now we're going to take like the strongest red card on Arena, Fable the Mirror Breaker, multi-format all-star, busted card, three mana to get a 2-2 two -two that taps, that creates a treasure token every time it attacks, then discard a couple cards, draw a couple cards, and then get another 2-2 two -two with an incredibly good activated ability, being able to duplicate a creature till end of turn. Fable the Mirror Breaker is just a bonkers card, easily the pick. Now pack two, pick two, pushing towards mono red aggro. Monastery Swift Spear is going to be a very premium card for us. One mana for a one, two haste to guarantee damage in early game. And it has prowess as well to make it very difficult for our opponent to block well, because they always have to be worried about us having like a lightning strike or any kind of instant to buff it up and win the combat easily. Elder Dragon War, another good card. This is for the more mid rangier grindier kind of deck, but we want to be really low to the ground here. Take the Swift Spear first. Pack two, pick three. There's a Chandra Awaken to Inferno, but again, I'm pushing as aggressively as I can here in a six drop. A little bit high on that curve for an aggro deck. This is, again, a lot more fun, a lot more powerful in the big rampy version of this kind of build. I'm going to go for the Eidolon of the Great Revel, though, which is a lot better for the aggro version. Two mana for a 2-2. Two, two. Whenever a player casts a spell with mana value three or less, 
this deals two damage to that player. The way that this card is valuable to you is that when you're the mono red deck, when you're super aggressive, you usually don't care about your life total that much because the vast majority of the time you're the most aggressive deck at the table. So this makes it so as your opponent is casting their cheap creatures or cheap removal to try to stay alive, try to stop your early aggro, they're also taking a bunch of damage. So it is a double-edged sword, you're both taking damage, but when you're the mono red deck, every point of damage you deal is a lot more important than... Uh, than your own life total. Like if there was a card that was just one red mana, deal five damage to each player's, mono red would play that in a heartbeat. Super difficult decision here, but I think I'm gonna go with Lightning Bolt. One red mana instant, three damage to any target. A classic, absolutely incredibly powerful card. One mana, three damage is just so efficient and it's instant speed as well. Really, really good stuff here. There's also really good creatures for us. Dragon's Rage Channeler. Let's us surveil every time we cast a non-creature spell and potentially turns into a 3-3 flyer for only one. And Goblin Chain Whirler, very nice enter the battlefield effect on this card, dealing one to your opponent and all their creatures. So really good stuff in that pack. But I'm going to go with a Lightning Bolt. I really, really like cheap burn spells, allowing us to deal a few damage to our opponent, finish them off, or alternatively um, get rid of one of their creatures, get something out of the way. Here I'll take a Phoenix trick here, 1 mana, 1, 1 flying haste, can't block, just get some aggro going. Again, trying pretty desperately to push into mono red. The more aggressive your deck is, the better it is to be as close to mono colored as possible in cube in general, because then you don't have to spend any picks on mana fixing, and you never have to stumble on mana where you don't have the right color of mana. Aggro decks really, really benefit from going 1 drop, 2 drop, 3 drop, never missing on that curve. And when you have two colors of mana, that's going to exponentially increase your chances of missing on the correct color of mana at a certain time or missing on that land drop when you need to cast something. So the more aggressive your deck is, the more important it is that you're able to play a spell every single turn early on. And it's a lot easier to do that when you don't have to worry about what colors of cards you have. So now we have a Legion War Boss as probably the strongest, cheapest card in the pack. Unfortunately, again, Arena's a little buggy right now when it comes to drafting. It is cutting off the left-hand side of the card there. That's not a recording error. That's just how it looks on Arena. Um, but a 3-mana 2-2 that keeps spitting out a bunch of 1-1s one to attack with. Nice little army in a can. Provides us with a ton of stuff. Now we have a Strangle here for a cheap removal spell to keep things out of the way. And we have pretty successfully pushed into completely mono red at this point to be a very aggressive strategy. The other thing that's nice about being a mono colored deck for being an aggressive strategy in the cube and why I definitely try to stick to as close to mono red or mono white as possible when I'm trying to be aggro in the cube is that the less colors you have, also sort of the less lands you need to a certain extent, it lets you be a lot more free to cut down to like 15 lands because another one of the... Um, reasons that limited decks generally run like 17 lands is because you're almost always two colors and you need to be able to hit like two mana of a certain color decently op often to where you could have like a double blue card in your deck and a double green card in your deck so you want to have like nine of one source seven of the other and cutting down on lands is going to kind of cut down on your sources of each color in a mono color deck you don't have to worry about that at all you're already going to have more red sources than you would if we were like red green if i'm a red green aggro deck with 17 lands, I probably have 9 or 10 red sources out of those 17 lands. If I'm a mono red deck with even 13 lands, I have more red sources than I would have had in the red green deck. So just keep cutting all these red cards here. We are very committed. I think I take Dragon's Rage Channeler over Chain Whirler. This is a pick I'm actually not that sure about. Um actually doing really good on one drops on the curve. I'll take Chain Whirler this time. Uh, but yeah, this looks like a sweet mono red aggro deck. The curve is looking great. We are going to beat some people down when they're just trying to do more dirtily fun mid-rangey stuff here. This looks like a pretty exceptional deck. We just need to find at least six more playables in the next pack, hopefully. Worst case scenario, we can run some somewhat filler cards like Big Score, Makeshift Munitions but I really like how this deck is shaping up when we have a whole other pack to go. And the only red card here being Spike Field Hazard, we'll take it. We can't afford to try to get to eight mana cards in this aggressive of a strategy. I could play Phyrexian Processor, I guess, but it feels a little slow. So I'll take Spike Field Hazard. Not a great card, but 
It's like a significantly better version of our 16th land or our 17th land because now we can play it as a land when we're low on mana and if we're not low on mana then all of a sudden that land actually gets to cycle to deal a damage to something. Uh, Zeriel's quite a solid planeswalker but actually kind of slow again for just like mono red aggro. I probably just want another removal spell but how's the creature count looking? Eight but we do have some sagas so it's more like nine when you count that saga. Creature count is pretty low. 10 when you count Elder Dragon War. I don't know. I'm still going to take Obliterating Bolt over Zeriel. I do really like Zeriel in a deck that has a lot of big beefy creatures because the ability to play like a 5-3 on turn 5 and then give it plus 1 plus 0 in haste is super big. But again, we're mono red, so most of our creatures just have haste anyway or they're small to where giving them haste isn't that crazy. This is easily a Bone Crusher Giant. This card's beautiful in this archetype and really in any. Being able to be both a cheap removal spell and a cheap, very large creature is just super nice. Really like Bone Crusher Giant. Also love that artwork, love that card style. Um, Beaumont Courier versus Royal Eruption. Now I think I'm actually going to take a creature over the, the burn spell or the removal spell because again our creature count's a little bit low and I do really like Beaumont Courier's ability to refuel our hand in the late game. Every time it attacks it's exiling a card. Eventually we sacrifice it, replace our hand with everything that we've exiled to it. So we just wait till we have like zero cards in hand and then discard our nothing to draw like three or four cards. Beaumont Courier's great. Happy to take it here. Because again, we have Lightning Bolt, Spike Field Hazard, Strangle, Lightning Strike, Obliterating Bolt. Doing pretty good on the burn spells. So take the Courier over the Royal Eruption this time. One's a little bit of a close pick, though. I do like those both. Uh, this is not a close pick. I like Light Up the Stage quite a bit. It's a draw two in red. And when you have so many haste creatures and so many ways to easily damage your opponent, it's one mana to draw two cards, essentially, which is incredibly good. Very, very good rate. Definitely taking Light Up the Sage over Jaxus, which is a little bit slow. Definitely not as good for the mana cost. Very fun card, very cool ability, but just a bit too slow, especially for aggressive strategies. Uh, now we have a Phoenix of Ash versus Experimental Frenzy. I'm actually going to take Phoenix of Ash here because it's just an incredibly impressive threat. Three mana for a 2-2 Flying Haste. You can buff it up, give it more power, and it can keep coming back from the graveyard to try to close the game out. Love that a lot. I do like Experimental Frenzy as well because when you get to the late game, this just lets you start playing things off the top of your deck instead. You can play like a million cards in one turn if you're lucky with how cards are, are stacked up. Um... My one problem with Experimental Frenzy is if you're not going to draw super well, then it doesn't uh, it doesn't do too much for you, because if you chunk up with two lands on top and you play a land off the top, and then there's just another one, it's like, ah, well, this card, I just spent four mana to do nothing. But I guess that's how basically any card draw would feel at that point. I don't know. Both of those cards are very good. Uh, but we're just going to take the, uh, the Phoenix here again. Still feels a tiny bit low on mana. Um... This could be wrong, but I think I want Searing Blood over Unholy Heat. So Unholy Heat does one mana for two to a creature Planeswalker, which is very cheap, very efficient. But um, Searing Blood, two mana for two damage. But this one can damage our opponent while we're killing their creature, which sounds pretty valuable to me for a very aggressive deck like this. This pack's a pretty easy pick. Castle Emberth would be good because it would make one of our mountains strictly better, but we get to cut some lands here, so we can just put more non-land cards in here, and that's fine. Uh, I just really love Bloodthirsty Adversary because it comes out really well at any point of the curve. Two mana for a 2-2 haste, great. Two mana for a 5-5, five five, or I'm sorry, five mana for a 3-3 three three haste that casts an instant or sorcery from your grave for free, also a very good deal. So two drop or five drop, we're in love with the card. We did wield the Zerial, so if we really wanted that, we can play that. But I feel like I'm going to cut that card. Most likely. Take a bunch of nonsense, because cube drafts are phantom, meaning we don't keep anything that we draft. So these picks don't matter at all if they're not going into our deck, and they are definitely not. And yep, nothing else we're going to play. So we have 26 cards in the deck, and I already cut our worst red cards 
which means we have multiple options. I don't think I'm going to go down to 14 lands, but I guess it is possible. I'm probably playing Crawling Barons, although there is a legitimate downside to playing a Crawling Barons in this deck. So this card makes it so we have a creature, an extra creature if we flood out. However, the downside to it is if we draw it as one of our few lands, which if we're cutting down on lands, we are going to have kind of a low count. Um, so like if I only have three lands and it's Mountain Mountain Crawling Barons, that's going to be a really bad time when I have a Goblin Chain Whirler in hand. Or if I have a two card hand, if I have a two land hand as my opener and I have to choose if I'm going to mulligan it, and it's Mountain, Crawling Barons, and a bunch of 1 and 2 drops, but two of those are like Searing Blood and Eidolon. It's also going to be really hard sell. So I think actually the Colorless... The fact that Crawling Barons makes Colorless means I might actually just not play it here, because I am tempted to cut down to even like uh, 14 lands here potentially. Um, so if I do cut down to 14 lands, I still have a Spike Field Hazard, making the deck essentially 15 lands when you count Spike Field Cave. So that seems like a perfectly reasonable place to be. However, let's just sort out the, the slowest and weakest cards in the deck and see if we'd rather play an additional mountain over any of them. Everything looking pretty good outside of that Phyrexian Revoker right now. Still looking great. Zerial's also a bit iffy, but that's about it. Everything else in the deck looking really nice. So is it worth it to play an additional mountain or a Crawling Barons over a Phyrexian Revoker or a Zerial? I mean, I really don't have a lot of late game stuff to do, but Zerial feels really low impact on the game and an aggressive strategy, right? Because what we want is we want to have cards that are just standalone threats. Something that comes out, hey, Sin gets a bunch of damage in, and Zerial doesn't really do that. Zerial over the course of a long game provides a lot of value, getting a devil token every single turn. But we want cards that just the turn you play them or the turn after you play them just immediately hit for a ton of damage. Zerial doesn't do that by herself. Zerial can make another creature haste and get in for extra damage, but... Or Zerial can make a bunch of devils, which is really impactful over a long game, but not over the first couple turns. Yeah, I'm not in love with the Zerial. I might still play Revoker just to keep the uh, the creature count high here, and then we just have some random main deck Planeswalker hate. Again, it's not exciting, but is what it is. And then we just play 15 lands and a Spike Field Hazard. Call it a deck. Seems like a pretty reasonable deck to me. I feel like this deck is probably evenly good with or without the Crawling Barons. There's the benefits of running it being that it's harder to flood out because now we actually have an additional creature to dump all of our mana into if we're flooding out. But the downside being we are going to have some games that this makes it really hard to cast Chain Whirler, make it more difficult to cast multiple red spells in one turn. Again, even if I don't have any double red or triple red cards in hand, we go back to that hypothetical where I open a two land hand and it's Mountain Crawling Barons. If the hand is Mountain Crawling Barons, and then it's like, you know, Kumano Faces Kakazan, Monastery Swift Spear, Lightning Bolt, Phoenix Trick, all that kind of stuff, it's still going to stop me from casting two one-mana spells on turn two, which I could have done otherwise. So I think I'm going to play without the Crawling Barons, but I could see a very fine argument for running it. But uh, I think outside of that, just cut that card and... Uh, We've got a deck. All right, here we have a look at the deck that we're going to be playing today. This is a very classic mono red aggro deck. This is an archetype that's been relatively powerful in pretty much every arena cube. And this one is no different. We have a very good aggressive curve of creatures. Tons of one and two mana plays with haste, such as Beaumont Courier, Phoenix Trick, Monastery Swift Spear to just get in for some cheap damage. Kamano faces Kakazan, also damaging our opponent turn one, making our next creature bigger, and then flipping into a haster. The two drops, again, some more hasting threats like Bloodthirsty Adversary. High power threats like Voltaic Visionary. Eidolon of the Great Revel, push, putting pressure on each player's life total in the early game. Phyrexian Voker, a little filler. But yeah, just a good swath of very aggressive creatures. More hasting threats like Phoenix of Ash at three mana. 
Chain Whirler, just big damage, high power creatures for cheap in the deck. So a big swath of one to three mana, super aggressive creatures, and a ton of cheap burn spells to back them up, clearing out any blockers from our opponent's board. Cards like Strangle, Lightning Bolt, Lightning Strike, Obliterating Bolt, Searing Blood, Flames of the Firebrand, etc. All of these cards can clear out opposing blockers, and most of them can instead, if we need to, finish off our opponent by shooting them for the last three or four points of damage. So that is the very classic mono-red aggro strategy. Tons of cheap aggressive creatures, tons of cheap burn spells to keep the board clear, and a couple big bombs at the high mana costs at the top end of the curve. Glorybringer here, a big hasting threat, something we obviously love in Mono Red Aggro, and this doubles as a removal spell as well. We have Chandra Torture Defiance, which works as both a removal spell and a card draw engine for us, with that plus one ability and minus three ability. Elder Dragon War can shoot our opponent in the face for two if we need to, but most of the time, four mana, four, four flyer, just aggressive threat there. And Ember Cleave, of course, kind of the combo finisher that just finishes people off before they have much chance of uh, even setting anything up. This card can kill people on like turn three, turn four. It's just very, very dumb. If you turn one, play like a Monastery Swift Spear. Turn two, you're playing like a Bloodthirsty Adversary. Turn three, I guess like turn four is when Ember Cleave would really pop off most of the time. Turn three, some other creature like Bone Crusher Giant. Turn four, you're attacking with three creatures. Your Ember Cleave only costs three mana. Slam an Ember Cleave on something, deal a million damage. Card is very dumb and ends games super, super quickly. So super happy to have Ember Cleave in here as well. So yeah, not much to say here. Just a very, very nice mono red aggro deck for today's Arena Cube draft. Here we are in game one on the play. I'm going to keep this. There is one thing I don't like about it, and that is that you can basically never justify not playing Kamano Faces Kakuza on turn one. And the problem is if I play it turn one, I'm not going to get a plus one plus one counter on anything from it on the second mode. But I'm still just going to play it there. Yep, we're not going to get a plus one plus one counter on any creature here, but that's fine. Let's obliterate this Dragon's Rage Channeler, get out of the way, and we'll play a War Boss next turn, attack with our 2-2 hasting Kumano Faces Kakazan. Playing against a black red deck, they've got a Rabbit's Battery down, a 1 1 haste that they can equip to another creature to give that plus 1 plus 1 in haste instead. We definitely play the Legion War Boss pre combat because that'll let its beginning of combat trigger, giving us a 1 1 hasting goblin. Again, every beginning of combat we get a 1 1 haste, and this has Mentor, so every time it attacks, it can put a plus 1 plus 1 counter on a smaller creature. So it can put counters on those goblins. Flames of the Firebrand, very, very good card for our opponent to have there. Going to kill both the Mentor itself and the um, uh, the War Boss itself. So Elder Dragon War here would blow up our own etching of Kumanos. That doesn't feel great. And I don't really want to discard and draw, so I think I'm just going to play a 4-4 Flyer off the Elder Dragon War for this turn. I could Searing Blood instead, but that's only utilizing half of my mana. Let's just get a 4-4 Flyer past the turn. Another Swamp from our opponent. They've got 4 mana available now. Attack in with the Rabbit Battery. That's pretty suspicious. They could be trying to play into a Lightning Bolt on the, the Dragon, or they could be going for a Board Wipe. We won't know because they're going to spend the rest of their mana on a Wrinkle. I could throw both Etching of Kumano and Searing Blood at this Wrinkle to kill it. That would two for one myself, but it might be worth it. Because they can't kill it otherwise. Unless they just like chump block. And I think I do want to stay aggressive and not just hold my dragon back as a blocker. Sure. Send everybody in. Yeah, we'll two for one into the Wrinkle here. And then post-combat, I am going to drop the idol onto the Great Revel. So now if my opponent plays anything that costs three or less, they take two damage from the idol on. 
and they're at seven life, so that's going to be tremendously more painful to them than it is to us. And as you can see, this is what I love about the Eidolon. Usually what happens is your opponent just uses a cheap removal spell and takes a couple damage in the meantime. Now a Heartless Act on our Dragon. And then a Beaumont Courier seems like a great spot for us to be in. They're only hitting us for two a turn. And as soon as we hit one more land, we have a Glorybringer to just finish them off. Four damage to their face, so... I could Lightning Bolt the Beaumont Courier, but if I Lightning Bolt their face, then if I top deck a land, Glorybringer kills them immediately, so I think I just Bolt their face here. Bank on whenever we hit the land drop, Glorybringer killing them in one attack. Ooh, if they paid the life for that Blood Crypt. Just Lightning Bolt. The face here. Yeah, we're dying in like seven attacks from this Beaumont Courier. Six, actually, technically. So I don't feel a need to kill it. It can provide them with a new hand, but only if they sacrifice it. And in order to sacrifice it right now, they have to pay a life because they have to use Sulphur Springs currently. If they want to do it this turn. So they'd go to one life to do that. Ooh, Flames of the Firebrand off the top. Another pretty solid reason to Lightning Bolt the face. We have plenty of other burn spells in the deck that would stack up into lethal. So we have like probably 12 different win conditions in our deck that we could draw out of the 28 cards. A little bit less than a 50-50 chance of just winning the game on the spot, because every single mountain in the deck would have won the game on the spot after lightning bolting their face, and uh, every single burn spell in the deck as well. So good stuff there. 1-0, very quick game against a Rakdos aggro deck. Here we are on the play again for round two. My issue with this hand is we don't have any of our cheap plays. We have two of our four drops and a five drop here. This is a dramatically slow hand based on the average. We only have four cards in the whole deck that cost more than three mana, and we have three of the four in this hand. I kind of feel like I have to mulligan here, but I don't want to because the card quality is so high, but I am going to mulligan here. And here we are. We are really getting the ball rolling with this hand. Yeah, let's go for it here. I think I get rid of Lightning Bolt because I really want to hit another land for Chandra. So I don't want to get rid of a land and then need to hit two lands to get to Chandra. But I mean, I suppose I can cast most spells in my deck for only two mana. Like 50% of them. And we know we have Kamano faces Kakazan into Eidolon. Maybe I'm supposed to get rid of Chandra. That feels wrong. If I'm getting rid of Chandra, I'm just getting rid of a land anyway. Because the only thing I need the third land for is Chandra. Ah, Bolt is so good. Okay, I'm getting rid of Bolt here. That might be wrong, but we're probably not going to play Bolt till like turn four anyway. And if we're going to Bolt something on turn four, we can just use Chandra to Bolt it with a minus three and then still have a threat left behind. All right, ridiculous curve now. We drew a Phoenix of Ash here, so now we have a three drop. So we just go one, two, three, four. Counting with the count, Sesame Street style. Some cookie cutter magic here, paint by numbers stuff. Hopefully this is as easy of a game as it seems like it's gonna be, but look at this board state here. Do I play the Haster or do I play the Goblin Producer? Let's play the Goblin Producer, a little, a little more fun. But I mean, look at this. They have to lose their mana dork here to trade into the goblin or just take a million. This is turn three and I have a 3-3, three, three, a 2-2, two, two, a 2-2, two, two, and a 1-1. One, one. And next turn, if war boss doesn't die, I get another 1-1. One, one. Their only hope here is a board wipe and they need it fast. And they're on green black. I guess if they have some good lifelinkers, since they are in, in, uh, in black here, I had a lot of the great revel being an incredibly impressive card here. Just, just shooting our opponent for so much damage. Now we drop a Chandra to get the Rishkar out of the way. And they only have a 2-2 left. They trade into the War Boss, take 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. They go to 1 life if they trade into War Boss, so yeah, we attack with everybody. And that's the best trade that they have, is trade for War Boss. They'd be at one life, which means if they cast anything that costs three or less, they're just dead. Disgusting curve, that game. 
Good gravy. Mono Red is taking no prisoners today. We are headed into game three undefeated. Here we are now for game three. We don't have a turn one play, but we do have great spells for turn two, three, and four, especially if we hit a couple more lands. Even if we don't, we have access to Bolt, Visionary, and Stomp, so plenty of options. Even if we miss on a land drop or two. We do immediately hit a mountain, so I get to just drop Visionary this turn. And I currently have plenty of stuff to play, so I'm not going to be using this activated ability. I'm just going to be sending in for damage. We've got a Swift Spear we can play. So we can say we can play Swift Spear and Lightning Bolt this pack leader out of the way. And just get in for some damage. Feels pretty good to me. Plenty of other lines we could have taken that turn. I could have just attacked with Visionary and offered the trade. Spent all my mana on a Phoenix of Ash there just to hit in the sky. I'm a pretty big fan of just clearing their board, keeping all of our creatures out while we can. Stomp feels pretty nice here. We can stomp and then light up the stage post-combat, picking up a land off of it. Making sure they're not ramping up. Keeping them on the back foot here, hitting them for another five. Their life total has already been halved now. And hopefully hitting a mountain off this light up the stage. No mountain, a bit awkward, but both of these are castable next turn, one of them being a removal spell. Pretty devastating if our opponent plays a two toughness or less creature. That pretty much just kills them if they tap out for a two toughness or less creature. And that's a 1 1 from Lovestruck Beast, but then they do get a 5 5 they can actually block with. I can do four, I can do two damage with Searing Blood and three damage to their face. Can get the 1 1 out of here. And the 5-5 five, five remains. Oh, their Dragon War doesn't do a whole ton. What are they going to do with the 5-5 five, five here? They block the Visionary and take 2 damage from Swift Spear, 1 damage from Courier. They're taking 3, they're going to 7. Take 3 more, they're down to like 4. And then we have a Hasting Flyer coming up. Seems reasonable to just Searing Blood plus Beaumont Courier. I could also Searing Blood the Beast. But that wouldn't do enough damage, because it would do two damage to it. It would have three toughness, essentially. Swift Spear would have two power because of prowess, and we don't have another spell we could cast. We do have Elder Dragon War guaranteeing two more damage to opponent. Yeah, I think we shoot the 1-1. One, one. Drop the Courier. Guarantee three more damage to our opponent. That puts them to four life. If they don't get any life gain, then being at four life, ooh, they kill Swift Spear, so they're gonna be at three life, which means they're dead to a lot of spells in the deck. But I was gonna say, even at four life, they're dead to one Phoenix of Ash attack plus the two damage from Dragon War. Being at three life means we might even just draw into another Flames of the Firebrand style three damage spell and just shoot them in the face or lightning strike. We've already used Lightning Bolt, but Lightning Strike and stuff like that would work. Alright, so they're just making a very chunky defenses. None of it flying, though. So Phoenix of Ash is going to be huge here, especially since they're tapped out. So we are definitely on Phoenix of Ash as the play this turn. I don't have the mana to uh, buff it up. I think I'm going to shoot myself with Visionary here and see what we hit. If we had a land card, I can just play it, and that'll flip this thing. Spike Field Hazard? That's just lethal. Oh my god. Disgusting. One damage. Just enough to finish them off with Phoenix of Ash. Great stuff from the Volt Charged Berserker. The luck is not running out here. We are, we are definitely the villains today. 3-N-O, heading into game four. Here we are in game four, opponents on the play. Less creatures in this hand than we've been having, which is a little scary, but we've got that nice early Eidolon, tons of removal to go with it. If we're in a mirror match, it could be bad, or if our opponent's like mono white aggro, um, because then we might end up playing this Eidolon and then hurting ourselves a lot more than we hurt our opponent, um, which could be bad in aggro mirror. And it looks like an aggro mirror, they're gonna be on a uh, red white aggro. Gonna go ahead and spike field hazard their Pyromancer. 
um, before we play the Eidolon, obviously, because I don't want to take a damage from it. But I'm still going to play the Eidolon here. But this is a matchup where it is going to actually be a very double-edged sword. Luckily, our opponent doesn't play a creature here, so Eidolon gets to hit them for two. But that Oketra's Monument's a pretty big problem. That is going to create a 1-1 Soldier every time they cast a creature spell. A 1-1 Warrior with Vigilance, uh, which is a very good blocker for our Voltaic Visionary. They're going to Unholy Heat the Eidolon, take a couple damage for doing so. I'm pretty happy with that. They obviously don't know the distribution of our hand, but having two more nice cheap removal spells, I'm pretty glad the Eidolon is gone here. And now they Lightning Bolt the Visionary, so no creatures here? Or maybe a two-drop creature. Ooh, Luris of the Dream Den costs one less mana because of Oketra's Monument. I'm definitely going to kill that Luris, and the best part about it is with Elder Dragon War, I can do two damage to Luris and their 1-1 one, one Warrior. So we'll go for the full value Elder Dragon War this time. And our opponent's down to one card in hand. We still have three removal spells in hand. And an Elder Dragon War threatening to become a 4-4 flyer in a couple turns. Opponent did just get a creature land here. Den of the Bugbear can turn into a goblin that attacks and spits out more goblins, which is actually quite threatening. But luckily we're just going to shoot that the second they try to do that shoot the den before it attacks so that they don't get any goblins. One of the really cool, really interesting things about this card is if you have eight mana, you can activate its ability twice and it'll gain that ability that says when it attacks, create a one one. It'll gain that ability twice. So when it attacks, you'll get two one ones. So that's a pretty cool, very corner case thing that I've seen be brought up. That's uh, super cool to keep in mind. Uh, we definitely don't need the fifth land right now. So we'll go ahead and turn that into another card. All right, it's another fifth land, fine by me. Means if we draw into Glorybringer, we can cast it, but I think that's the only thing in our deck that would need it. But we're still very good here. We've got all the removal we could possibly need to make sure the Den doesn't hit us. If they play any other good threats, we can blow them up as well. And as for how we're trying to close out the game, hopefully this 4-4 four, four flyer can do that. It'll only take three attacks to do so. And if they play a creature, it's only going to take two attacks from the Elder Dragon War, because we can hit them for four with Strike for three and Searing Blood for, for two. Um, when it enters the battlefield, they get to use the trigger, put counters on it, and cast something for free. So you're going to cast a Lightning Bolt for free and shoot my face? Okay, this is fine. Um, I can blow that up with a Searing Blood um, before the ability resolves. So it won't get the plus and plus one counter. I think they still get to cast the spell, but I'm gonna another three damage to my face is whatever, that's fine. They don't have like a dramatically good instant or sorcery to play here. Yep, down to 13. I mean, Lightning Bolt is a very good instant or sorcery. It's just that my life total is high enough and I don't have like a good creature for them to kill with it that it doesn't matter too much right now. If I had like a 3-3 three, three first strike or even anything, even like a 2-2 two -two haste on board, uh, I would be much less happy with the recast of Lightning Bolt. Um, I have one other way to discard cards and draw cards in this deck, so I'm actually going to start holding on to at least one land from now on. We do have a Fable of the Mirror Breaker in here. Yikes, I might have to... Um... Oh wait, no, they're choosing to discard a card, draw a card. Okay, so they're gonna they kill the dragon, discard a card, draw a card. Alright, I thought they were gonna do the plus four plus zero to the one one. And then I was like, maybe it's worth lightning striking the one one to not take uh, five damage right now. But if it's just one, we'll keep that thing around. Save our removal for something else. I think I do play one land in case I hit a light up the stage. Because then I would need more than 5 mana because I'm going to spend 3 mana on light up the stage and want a bunch of extra mana for whatever comes after that. Still don't think I'm throwing a removal spell at the 1-1. Just need to draw something. I'm going to go into full control here so I can kill the Aspirant before its ability triggers. Because that's an ability that triggers at the start of combat. Alright, 
getting out of full control mode. Take one from the 1-1. One, one. Another land for our opponents. That is awkward. Another sorcery speed removal spell. If this were instant speed removal, we could kill the den with it. That was the one problem with blowing up Aspirant there, is now we don't have instant speed removal for the den. That might actually cost us the game. Yeah, that's awkward. I suppose I should have just let them get the plus one plus one counter and then blew up the Aspirant with the Obliterating Bolt. That way I know for sure I have a way to kill the den still. Rather than banking on drawing something decent here. Because we are dying a lot quicker now. Phoenix of Ash doesn't do it. Yeah, no, we actually might have won this game if I... Uh, if I held off and then I drew into the strangle, I would have strangled the Aspirant. Because then I would have been able to get two attacks off Phoenix of Ash. Because I would have been able to Lightning Bolt the Den of the Bugbear, which stops a significant amount of damage. 3-2 and the 1-1. One, one. And then they're attacking with a 3-2 and a 1-1 one, one again the next turn. Yeah, I think I punted this one away. That is unfortunate. I was just st so instinctually wanting to kill the Aspirant before it got the plus one plus one counter value. But I wasn't considering the Den of the Bugbear being unstoppable. If I did that, I guess the game's not over. I can block with a Phoenix of Ash, and that's a way to kill the den. Problem is, I block the den and take four from all the other creatures. I have to throw these really... I have to throw removal spells at these really mediocre creatures now. Yeah, we're in a devastatingly bad spot. This is never what you want to do with your red deck. Uh, that feels pretty bad. Sequencing sequencing this game differently, having the lightning strike to kill Dana the Bugbear, I think Phoenix of Ash is actually enough to win the game. Unless they have an exile-based removal spell. Ooh, well, they could exile our graveyard, so... Could have stopped the Phoenix from ever coming back. If they have a non-exile removal spell. Okay, they're going to activate the den. Yeah, this is super bad for us since we have to be blocking with the phoenix. They get to exile it from our grave. Yep, I think if this is the sequence of cards they had, we 100% would have won lightning striking the den. Because the Phoenix of Ash wouldn't be in the grave now, because we would have been attacking with it, and we would have been at a significantly higher life total. Um, if I try to cast the Phoenix, we get them to kill the Cleric, and then playing a Swift Spear is enough to just barely survive. So we need to force them to sacrifice the Cleric here. They don't sack the Cleric. That is probably not a good sign for me. Venerated Loxodon, Monument making another 1-1, one, one. buffs all the creatures. Double buff, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Our only chance at victory is if they just don't block for some reason. But they're definitely going to chump block. There's no other reason they would have been holding on to this cleric. I'll send in the Swift Spear as well, so it looks slightly less suspicious. It looks like maybe it's just a chump attack. All 
All right. Unfortunate game there. We could have won that one pretty handily. Sequence things out very incorrectly. Needed to... Needed to keep in mind that Den of the Bugbear could not get killed by all our sorcery speed removal, whereas the Aspirant could have. We could have dealt with both of the biggest threats instead of just the one. Taken significantly less damage over those next few turns, which would have allowed us to just be attacking with our Phoenix. Find that lethal early. Three and one it'll be, heading into game five. Here we are now in game five. Definite keep here. Some exceptional cards. Opponent is on black and Goblin Chain Warrior is going to have a fun time playing around with that Shambling Ghast, I can tell you that. Black red from our opponent, Battle Cry Goblin is the play here. We are a little on the defensive because our opponent's on the play and we're on the draw, so I think we actually just bone crush this Battle Cry Goblin. In an aggro mirror match, it's kind of just whoever's on the play is the aggro and whoever's on the draw is on the defensive. So we're going to play it slow and remove their creatures rather than dumping stuff on our board right now. Because our opponent did curve out. One drop creature, two drop creature. Would love to see another one toughness creature. We do not live the dream. Chain Warrior just going to kill one thing, but that is still pretty spicy. I get a treasure token out of this gasp. Discard a card, draw a card off of their blood token, discarding a Witch of the Moors. So if they have any life gain in their deck, they can pick this up later with their Blood Fountain and try to use that effect. The Witch of the Moors is a very, very scary card when you have consistent life gain on the board. It makes it so during your um, end step, I believe. Yeah, if you gained life, each opponent sacks a creature and you return a creature from grave to hand. It's pretty insane. Hey, Eidolon of the Great Revel, I know that card. I like that card. But I have way more spells to cast than my opponent does right now, so I think I need to bolt that card. Awkwardly. Because otherwise that's going to do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 damage to me. By the end of this game. Opponents down to nothing, potentially? We'll find out. Play a bunch of haste. Alright. Maybe it's all four mana and up in their hand. Six, seven. Alright, they scoop them up. It must be. Did I have fun in the match? Uh, I don't know how they use this information, because, like, sure, I had fun. I played a mono-red deck. I was aggressive. I won the game, but... I don't know how they use this information to where, like, I don't want the takeaway to be one player got a little mana screwed, and so it was a fun game. Because, <laughs> like, my opponent did get a little mana screwed. That wasn't that fun, that they didn't get to play all their spells. It's so, like, I don't know. Just, I'm going to be honest. I played dumb red cards and beat some face. My opponent's over there trying to get a, a real estate deed. Here we are in game six. We are four wins and one loss with a tremendously keepable hand here. Very aggressive. Swift Spear turn one. We can use this to get a light up the stage early. Not if they have a fatal push. Then we're going to have to play a little more defensively and blow up everything they're going to play with our cheap interaction. Now we don't have a creature till turn three. Another Rakdos deck. This is a slower one though, so probably pretty controlling. They're a black-red deck that the only spell they've cast till turn 3 is a removal spell. So they could even be Grixis, like blue-black-red control. If they have removal, now is the time to use it, or I'm going to get a goblin. Okay, they're going to kill my 2-2, make me discard a card. I don't actually think Strangle's going to be all that good here. Flames could kill more things. I definitely want to keep the land, because I'm trying to get to 5 mana for Glorybringer. Kologon's Command, though, an incredible card. Basically always a two for one. You spend your one piece of interaction to blow up their best artifact and one of their two toughness creatures, or blow up one of their two toughness creatures and make them discard a card, or blow up their best artifact and return a creature from your grave to hand. Literally always a two for one. Incredible, incredible command. 
Now Rankles come in. We've got that Flames of the Firebrand to kill that. No abilities from Rankle here. Interesting. Yep, Flames that away. Past the turn, we are one mana away from Glorybringer. Morbid Opportunist and a Grim Lava Mancer. So the Opportunist is going to make it so they draw a card every turn that a creature dies, which is pretty brutal. I think I need to light up the stage, hope to hit a mountain, and we're just trying to Glorybringer the Opportunist away before I kill anything else, because we don't want them to go incredibly far ahead in card advantage. Mountain Phoenix Trick. If I play this Phoenix Trick, they can use gl the Grim Lava Mancer to draw a card off of killing it. Right, because I play it, I attack in. Next turn, they just exile two cards from their grave, shoot the Phoenix Trick, and draw a card off Opportunist. I really don't want to let them do that. So I guess I'm just going to let Phoenix Trick stay exiled forever. And I could Bone Crush the Lava Mancer in their end step, then they're guaranteed to draw two cards off Opportunist, because they'll draw a card when Lava Mancer dies, then draw a card when I kill Opportunist with Glorybringer. That also feels bad. Opportunist is just a wild card. Oh my god, Fable the Mirror Breaker now. Nothing but bangers from our opponent here. Yeah, I think we need to kill Opportunist first with Glorybringer, and then the world is opened up. We can stomp whatever we need to. Did hit the mana to play Phoenix Trick now, so now I can do that after Opportunist is gone. Yeah, since Opportunist is going to be gone here, we can drop the Phoenix Trick. So now they can still Lava Mancer the Phoenix trick away, which is fine, because they don't draw a card when they do that. Mayhem Devil. We haven't seen any sacrifice effects from them yet, which means all of their sacrifice effects are probably still in their deck. I guess Rankle technically counts. Oh no, treasure tokens count. Oh god, Mayhem Devil's nuts. Yeah, Mayhem Devil works with treasure. So, with Lava Mancer plus the treasure, they can do three damage right now, which means once this goblin attacks again, they'll be able to deal four damage. So, we need to kill the Lava Mancer or we need to kill the Shaman before they untap, before they get another turn. Um, and I think I'd like to play the Bone Crusher as a blocker, so I'm going to do that in main phase two here, kill one of those two cards. Four cards in their grave. They can use Lava Mancer twice. Can use Lava Mancer twice, they can use the treasures from the Shaman like forever, every single turn. The Mayhem Devil. Alright, well, Phoenix Trick can't block, so we send that in. But weirdly enough, I think we're killing the Goblin Shaman and not the Lava Mancer. I guess Lava Mancer is providing them four damage guaranteed. Shaman. Two damage if it gets one more attack in. And if I have a 4-3 blocker on the board, it probably only gets one more attack in. I really don't like not having the stomp to get rid of the reflection of Kiki Jiki as well here. But this is kind of where we're at. Things are gonna be super super bad if we let the Lava Mancer stay. So I'm gonna get rid of the Lava Mancer, and then I'm hopefully gonna block the 2-2 with my 4-3 Bone Crusher Giant and they will trade with each other because they can sack a treasure to do the next damage to the Bone Crusher. 
And then if Glorybringer manages to survive all of their treasure sacking nonsense, we can use the Glorybringer to kill the Reflection of Kiki Jiki or them. I mean, we have an Ember Cleave in hand. Glorybringer for 10 damage in the sky. Can be a lot. Oh, you know what they could do here? That might be... Okay, that's a little weird. I was going to say what they could do here that might be worth it would be to sack a treasure to kill the Grim Lava Mancer and counter the Bone Crusher Giant. They choose to use Grim Lava Mancer on itself instead. I guess that works too if they need the treasure for something else. That does guarantee an attack with the Goblin Shaman. So they'll have two treasures. It's not enough to kill a Glorybringer. But yeah, our opponent has like a million ways to, to kill whatever we target with our... Bone Crusher. If we targeted the Shaman, they could have Grim Lava Mancered the Shaman. So I should have kept that into account. It was still definitely the play. It's not like it was a misplay or anything. I just forgot that that was an option for them. Yikes. Rolling Barons is pretty scary here. Just more threats. Devil's Play for Lethal. Brutal. Alright, well... Opponent had that game in the bag, good lord. We are going to be 4 and 2, I believe. Mayhem Devil is a nasty card with treasure tokens. Here we are now in game 7. Easy keep. No plus one plus one counter from Kumano, but we still deal a damage immediately and start attacking them with a haster on turn 3. I guess I don't technically have a turn two play here, so I could have waited, but if I draw any other one or two drop, I would love to play that this turn, and I have a lot of those in the deck. Did not draw any of them, though. The life and times of Gomlet X. Usher of the Fallen coming out. Flames of the Firebrand, very good against that card. Okay, we've got a Lightning Bolt as well. Kind of interested in staying aggressive for now and playing one of my creatures. I'm going to go with the War Boss. Always like getting that out as soon as possible to get as many goblins as possible. Get them out every single turn that we move to combat with a Legion War Boss on the board. 1-1 one, one for 1-1 one, one trade. Love to see my opponent play any two toughness or less creature. Touch the spirit realm. That is not that. That is just going to exile the war boss. That's fair enough. I think we're still holding off for this um, Flames of the Firebrand to pop off here. Play one of our three drops and hold up a lightning bolt. I need treasures right now, but. Getting this reflection to flip as soon as possible is nice. Getting two two twos off the one card. Yeah, I'm gonna drop Fable first. Get this to flip sooner. Opponent has four mana up. Taking a good, long look at the board state here. Figuring out what they want to do in terms of interaction. Do they send an attack in? They're just going to pass turn. That is incredibly suspicious. That makes me tempted to just bolt here. Maybe they have a reclamation, or not a reclamation, uh, whatever the angel is called. Four mana, three, four flyer flash. I don't like that at all. That would be really good against me no matter what line I take, because it has four toughness. Searing Blood is a pretty good draw for if that's the case, because now I can Phoenix of Ash attack with everybody, get a treasure, and I use the treasure in the mountain to Searing Blood the Angel after it uh, blocks whatever.
Don't know what else they might have here. But there's definitely a list of stuff. We may be about to find out. This weird halo of light over their card. I don't know if that's always there. Maybe that's just on this board. It's very angelic for their mono white deck. The artwork on this thing is nasty. Your blood is literal lava just spewing out of your hand. It's so gross. Okay, well, I guess I have no idea what they have. We're just going to trade a 2-2 two, two, and a 2-1. Maybe it's a combat trick? Wandering Emperor. Yikes. That's a big yikes. I forgot about that card. That card is nuts. Although, if they choose to just go for first strike here, we can kill the Usher. I want to save the uh, treasure token. Not particularly. Especially when if I save the treasure token, I'm using my lightning bolt. When my lightning bolt can shoot a wandering emperor for three, but my searing blood can't. It's just due to a creature specifically. So we'll just get the creature removal out of the way there. Sacred foundry from our opponent. They are on red white. Red white control, wandering emperor into cast off. That is disgusting. We have been board wiped, but Fable of the Mirror Breaker luckily gets around that, as does Phoenix of Ash. This is going to be pretty good stuff for us. I'm going to drop Swift Spirit. I'm actually going to Flames the Emperor, so I still have the one mana three damage spell that I can play at instant speed, since I'm not doing anything else with my mana this turn. And this still guarantees the Swift Spear attack getting in. Still feeling pretty good here. I mean, we're very low on cards, but our opponent is very low on life, and we're an aggressive red deck, so... Lots of outs. Rabble Rousing. Every time they attack with a creature, they get a 1-1 Citizen, and when they have 10 or more creatures, they get to cast whatever spell is under the Rousing for free. And most importantly, that can potentially pr provide them with a million blockers. I can do 5 damage to their face with Bolt plus Bone Crusher, so if I get in for just 2 damage, they're dead. If either of these creatures gets in, they're just dead. All right, it's going to take three mana. Three mana to cast both of these. Yeah, so we'll use the one mana to just make another Swift Spear. They have to double block, and if they don't, they're dead. They don't double block, so stomp the face. Prowess, prowess. Bolt the face. Prowess, put them to negative one. And there we go. We are now going to be 5 and 2, heading into game number 8. Here we are now, game number 8. No one drop to play, but we've got great stuff on 2 mana, 3 mana. We've got to light up the stage to refuel. Quite a solid hand here. We are going to be on the draw, though, so opponent gets to be more aggressive, especially if they are an aggressive archetype like a white deck, white and red. The most aggressive decks in this format, particularly mono white and mono red. But they are going to be on white green. Turn one hopeful initiate, turn two Lotus Cobra. Would be happy to kill either of those cards. I think I'd like to kill the Lotus Cobra to stop them from playing anything that costs a million mana anytime soon. So I'm going to use the Bone Crusher Giant here to do that. Get that out of the way while they don't have the mana up to play any tricks to counter the Giant. Wedding announcement, yikes. It's a very, very good value play. It's going to give them any combination of three one ones or three card draws, and then it's going to give their whole board plus one, plus one. Very, very good card. Sees a lot of, uh, lot of play in constructed formats. Um, 
Not super sure what I do here. I could Searing Blood the Hopeful Initiate, since that is a full-on card, and that will get it so where they can't attack with two creatures, so they don't get to draw a card off of announcement next turn. I'll also deal damage to them, which lets me play Light Up the Stage for one mana to try to hit Mountains for next turn. This seems fine to me. There are definitely other lines, but I'm a decent fan of this one. Come on, give me some mountains, give me some mountains. We did get a mountain and a Fable of the Mirror Breaker. That's a little awkward, because if I want to play Fable of the Mirror Breaker, I have to play it next turn. I do want to play it, but at the same time, the reason I wanted this fourth mountain is really for Chandra. So we might be put in a position where I really want to just play Mountain, Chandra, plus the, the Chandra for mana, and then like Lightning Strike something. Heliod from our opponent, not that worried about that card. More of an enabler kind of card, can dump some mana into it to give things lifelink, put some counters on things as they gain life. So if they get some consistent ways to gain life easily, then it can stack into a lot quickly. And other than that, if they get five white symbols among their permanents, then it's a 5-5 five, five indestructible. Then it's a really big deal, but uh, it's a little difficult to do. Okay, so we're 100% playing this mountain. I do have a one mana play now, so I could play Fable of the Mirror Breaker and Kumano Faces Kakuzan. Much more reasonable thing to do here. Wedding announcement's gonna flip, they hit us for four. We're down to 13. I think we can recover going down to 13 here. I'll make sure I get the full value. Make it so we don't have to discard Fable of the Mirror Breaker there. Next turn, we're likely on Chandra. Get some mana out of her to cast another spell. Oh, announcement doesn't flip yet. They actually draw a card off of it here if they attack with both, but then I get to kill one of the 1-1s. One well, now I'm much happier with that play. I, I miscounted on announcement. I forgot that it's an end step trigger and not an upkeep trigger, I think is what was going on in my head. So yeah, I mean, it's just two 1-1s, one -one, so we take two damage here if they attack with everybody. And I'm probably just going to block. I guess it's a little risky, but they only have two cards in hand. Okay, they're going to removal spell the goblin. That definitely kills the goblin. We take five now. Ouch. Now if I play Chandra, I don't have any creatures. For Chandra to be blocking with. I could shut off Heliod's activated ability, but that's it. So I don't think Revoker is very valuable to me right now. Also a bit late in the game for Eidolon of the Revel, and it's kind of painful for me. I think I'm actually keeping this land, but I'm ditching Revoker and Eidolon. Because then I could go Chandra Mountain Bone Crusher, potentially. I don't think that's the play because they have a 4 4 and a 3 3, but. Maybe. Probably like Mountain Lightning Strike Bone Crusher. Right, well, if I hit two mountains, it's a little awkward, but. Yeah, I think we're on Lightning Strike Bone Crusher. Not in love with this, but our opponent's pretty low on cards too, and we're about to have a couple more 2-2s. Two Scavenging Ooze, yikes, that's incredibly good with Heliod, and that's actually an activated ability that I would want to shut off with Revoker. So, right when I discard Revoker, here comes Scavenging Ooze. Oh, that is disastrous. Yeah, red decks don't have a way to kill a creature that big. And it's going to be monstrously big. Every time they do it, they get a counter on Ooze and their other creature. Well, that could not have gone worse for us. That's probably it.
It is a Phoenix of Ash, but our opponent is still at 21. I can get some chump blocks going. Chandra, I could have six mana total. I can Chandra and Phoenix in the same turn. The minus ability doesn't do anything, so if I play Chandra, it's either to try to cast things off the top or to get some mana. Probably play Chandra and get some mana for now. And I need to be very, very much on the chump blocking train. I don't have the mana to make ooze any bigger right now. I think I might even just chump block with Phoenix of Ash. I'm on the chump block train though, Heliod can start giving lifelink to their 6-6. Six, six. Oh, which means I can't even outrace them because they're going to gain a million. Felidar retreat, please not a planes, please not a planes, please not a planes. It's a planes, so they get to cast Felidar retreat and use Heliod. And their board has vigilance now, so I don't even get a decent crack back. Five and three, it's gonna be. Gain a million life here off Heliod. That means they're tapped out of Scavenging Goose mana, so I do get to recast Phoenix of Ash if I have nothing else to do next turn. But yeah, I mean, Red just doesn't have enchantment removal either. This deck is just really, really good against Mono Red with a ton of life gain and enchantment based threats. Felidar Retreat is a card I can't deal with at all. Wedding announcement I can't deal with at all. It's just a really, really bad matchup for us. Oh, today's my lucky day. I can't play Phoenix if I play this. This'll be easy. But I can I can draw a fresh new hand. not have any attacks even if I duplicate things so I need to chump block with swift spear and a token copy of swift spear now Heliod's still popping off. I mean, I think I'm just gonna scoop at this point. We're mono red, we have no way to kill these 9-9s, nine we have no way to deal with enchantments. So they get to keep doing Felidar Retreat and Heliod things. They're gonna gain 9 life every combat minimum. There's no possible way we can stack up enough damage to outrace that while chump blocking every single turn. Yes, I can make a duplicate of Swift Spear, so I get two chump blocks off of the one card, and then I can do that with Bone Crusher Giant the next turn, but we're definitely dead, and it's probably going to take at least like four more turns, which is going to take at least like uh, five more damage. Sad face. <laughs> we'll sad face that one. Um... Five and three it is. Really unfortunate way to end that. I think this deck was 
incredibly powerful. I think I was pretty happy with how things went in the draft pod. So very, very happy with my choices during drafting and the deck that we ended up with. The big issue here was some gameplay errors. We 100% could have won the match against the Boros aggro deck that had a Den of the Bugbear out. Had I held on to the Lightning Strike to deal with that and cast one of our Sorcery Speed Removal spells on their Aspirant instead, we 100% would have won the game, which would put our record at 6-2 and two right now after losing to that green-white deck. Uh, giving us the chance to go into the final boss and compete for a seven win run. But again, another look at the deck. Very happy with pretty much everything here. I mean, Revoker was an underperformer, but that was the weakest card in the deck we knew from the start. Uh, first time I played around with Eidolon of the Great Revel, and I was very, very happy with it in multiple of these games. It was some very spicy stuff. Everything in the deck was uh, pretty awesome. Super happy with it. Um, next worst cards, probably just like Elder Dragon War, because it's a little bit slow. Um, not much else though. I mean, the sorcery speed removal was a little bit of a bummer as well. I would prefer to have a little bit more at instant speed because then that whole uh, the whole deal with the uh, den of the bugbear wouldn't have even happened if all our removal was instant speed. So that could have made it better as well. But the big thing was some gameplay errors, such as that round against the den of the bugbear. That would have put the the deck at six and two after losing that final round, which I think was pretty much a guaranteed loss. I think. Both of our other losses I'm, I'm perfectly happy with. Um, we just got out uh, out aggroed against the Rakdos deck. They had the big Devil's Play to shoot us for seven and shoot us with a treasure token to kill us out of nowhere. Um, and then we just lost against a deck that had a very good matchup against us, the green-white kind of life gain deck there in the end. So those rounds I'm, I think we're pretty much always going to lose, happy to lose them. Really the round against the Boros deck, that's a that's a big bummer, because had we not lost that round, 6-2 and two right now heading into the final boss, and who knows what we would have gotten paired up against, very well could have gotten a 7-win run out of this deck, and I think this deck could have, uh, could have definitely earned it, but human error going to definitely take us away from that, but we still get all the gold that we spent on the event back out of it, which is nice, 4,000 gold and 3 cards as our prizes, and we get to learn from our mistakes, which is always nice as well. I will definitely be certain to hold on to all my instant speed removal against creature lands in the future, rather than kind of playing on instinct, playing on default. That is one of the things that, uh, that I think is pretty bad. It's really easy to do while you're multitasking as well, such as when you're like recording a video and trying to explain a bunch of things, try to keep the, the commentary going and try to make things entertaining. So I was kind of just... You'll notice it a lot. A lot of the mistakes that happen in my videos are kind of me just like playing on default. And it's kind of just like the default thing to do. Oh, there's a Luminarch Aspirant. Let me make sure to kill this before they move to combat to stop it from triggering. I just, because I was defaulting to that play, just completely forgot about holding on to the instant speed removal for the den. So that's the main thing that's uh, the main takeaway here. The main thing I need to learn from and try to get better at is... Um, kind of doing the default play a little less often, really considering everything that's that's going on in the current the current moment rather than just going back to, yeah, always bolt the bird or always shoot the, the goblin before it makes the additional token or always shoot the aspirin before it makes the additional token. Sometimes, sometimes there's reasons to keep your instant speed removal for other stuff. So that's the big takeaway of today's video. Uh, I did really enjoy the deck, really enjoyed playing with it. Some real nice mono red aggro stuff. I think it was a beautiful deck, and it led to some just atrocious games. Some of those victories were disgusting. I think there are very few decks that could have won some of the games that we won. Um, there are very few decks that could have beaten us in some of the games that we won where we had just ridiculous curves. Um, so those were super nice, and yeah, pretty great time overall. Hope you all enjoyed the video as much as I enjoyed playing it. If you want to see some more videos like this, you can always like, comment, and subscribe to let the YouTube algorithm know to send you some more in your recommended feeds. We've got more Arena Cube on the horizon. The Arena Open is tomorrow, and that is Arena Cube Draft, so I will be playing that probably just one attempt this time around, maybe two, uh, but not a ton of it. Probably not going to get super competitive with that one. Um... And then we have more Alchemy Brothers War Drafts. I'll do one or two more of those. And 
any other limited events that they put up for the holiday season we'll be playing around with. So lots of fun drafts on the horizon if you're into it. Other than that, as always, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again soon for some more Magic Arena.